Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Elfrida Martina, and, uh, and I'm not from Nepal. <laughs> I went recently to Nepal. I wish I had. I, 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 I would be from Nepal, so I could actually provide a little bit more of that um, informed uh, participation here. But I'm the director of the Transregional Center for Democratic Studies here at the New School for Social Research, and together with uh, uh, India China Institute and uh, its directors, and the director, uh, Ashok Gulok, we, we want to welcome you you here today. Um, and today is October 9th, but on, October, on November 9th, 25 years ago, um, a bunch of people of various ages, more or less like you, went on the top of the Berlin Wall and began to chipping it away. And that was the beginning of the end of the Cold War at the time, of the uh, one party state in the region of the divided Berlin, of, divided, of the divided Europe. And um, this event today, as unlikely as it appears, because it's about um, developments which are taking place somewhere else, and about, uh, about an incredible account of those developments that uh, we are going to discuss today in the, in the book of or the bullet or the battle box. And uh, so the develop, development in, developments in, uh, in Nepal in a very interesting way are connected with the generation of, uh, of movements for autonomous society, for democracy um, as uh, and framed by the local culture and the and local political traditions. And, and, um, and it is a, a place in which the transition or transformation, which uh, began in 1990, uh, I think, I'm not, you know, I'm not big authority on that, but I decided that that is the day that I can stick to, 1990, is the, kind of the, the second wave of this inspira aspirations for democratic change in Nepal. It's still taking place, although it's taking place, and it appears to be different. The process appears to be different than the one that happened in Europe with the collapse of Berlin Wall. Uh, the split the, the city, the split Europe, uh, is no more. And um, it seemed, after 25 years later, that it happened overnight. It was just a miraculous moment that uh, Berlin Wall collapsed. Communism was gone, or the version that was there was gone. And, um, and you know, that the life would be better ever after. And it wasn't miraculous. It didn't happen overnight. In fact, and, and that's, that's where the connection here actually in Nepal is very important to mention. In fact, the chipping uh, of the Berlin Wall began eight months earlier. Probably even years earlier, but I will just uh, agree with you here on eight months earlier, in 1989, in April, when, at the, when in Warsaw, the, the, the members of the Solidarity Trade Union, the leaders of the Solidarity Trade Union, sat together with the uh, representatives of the regime, of the communist regime, to discuss possibility of democratic opening in the country. It was April of 1989 eight months before the fall of the nations. Then it was nation after nation after nation, uh, and the communism was gone. But the very first, I want to go back to that, to this moment of negotiations um, at this enormous, humongous round table in Warsaw. 100 people were sitting at that table. It was very difficult to build a table like that, but they actually ordered it in the furniture factory, a huge, huge, uh, they were a, a kind of empty hole in a, in a, like a wheel, it looked like a wheel. And of course, it was not that the discussion could be going on at the table. The table was just the beginning at the end, and then people divided into smaller subtables. And that's where they, they uh, agreed, despite all ads, despite the fact that it was the negotiators who were the former, recent political <coughs> prisoners, who were trying to negotiate and to have a dialogue with, the, with their own prison guards. So the unusual, the unusual situation, which, which is also uh, something that uh, we will hear about 
today, which have happened actually in the, in the panel. Um, and, um, and yes, two months later, there was the, the first democratic election took place in June. <coughs> and it took, it took uh, several months for the, you know, I made a note of it, but I won't remember if I want to take a look. Two million tons of concrete, that was very well. 700,000 tons of steel. Um, attack dogs, the tank traps, barbed wire, all of that disappeared, but it took time for other, for other countries to join in. Um, today, we have this uh, un unusual, really, opportunity to open our series of discussions on 1989 with Nepal. And we have an um, uh, extraordinary, uh, uh, we are very lucky. We are very lucky that we, we that the book has been just published that came out, and I don't know whether Aditya Aguiari uh, meant it that way that it came on that on the very anniversary. Um, but um, um, but the uh, but the book is here, and we will be talking about, uh, in a way, emergence through the right of movement, the mobilization of different movements, emergence of uh, democracies. What is interesting and different in Nepal, of course, is that it wasn't as peaceful. It wasn't as, um, uh, uh, it wasn't just simply a negotiated that on and off struggle for democracy um, was, um, it was a uh, part of that was really an armed struggle. Though I have to mention that in the other part of the world where the Berlin Wall collapsed, there were also violent moments and protractedly violent moments of 1956, October in 56 in Hungary, and 1968 in Prague, Prague Spring, 1981 in Poland, the state of war in Poland. It took time, it took time for the, for the victims and the perpetrators, for the oppressors and those who were oppressors together. And Nepal is an extraordinary place. Uh, in various ways. It was never a colony. It was never a colony sandwiched between, um, as Aditya, I've stolen that sentence from you, Aditya, uh, between uh, India and China. It has not been a colony, though it had a huge measure of its own oppressors and uh, regimes and uh, oligarchies, which, um, which uh, exploited their own people. And I think that one has to take it into account while talking about what is happening and what is happening today. The un uniqueness of this place is also that it's so extraordinarily uh, diverse. I was wondering how to put this round table, how it would have been if that round table would, be in, uh, would have uh, taken place uh, in, um, in Nepal. Of course, there would be different parties sitting at the table, but you know, there are not just parties there, right? Um, yeah, um, yeah. The divisions go very deeply through society. There are castes, there are classes, and there are ethnic groups, and there are identities. Fifty-nine of them that um, called indigenous, indigenous communities, and you have to take them into into into, uh, into consideration. But today we are going to talk about Maoists, about the communist groups group which split, as communists always love that factionalism, sectarianism. Uh, secrecy, undermining each other. You know, I always wonder why did they uh, not fight with the opposition instead of that fighting and really weakening the left has some weak points here, weakening themselves. Um, and yet, at some point, and they, and after the period of rebellions and uprisings, when they didn't have arms, when they cut arms, attacking, you know, initially the police stations, and they mobilized this incredibly oppressed rural population. Um, be, became a, a very important um, uh, spokesman on, the, on their behalf. How it happened that at some point they decided to sit down and talk to, with, the, with, the, with the other side. Um, so this is the story of today's uh, of today's uh, evening. It is and then another example of negotiated transition to democracy or negotiated, no matter how paradoxical it sounds almost oxymoronic, negotiated revolution. Revolutions are not negotiated, but that one ended up or ends up or we are at the moment when it is um, uh, the, the discussion and dialogue is still necessary. 
So we have with us today the author um, of the book. We have with the author of the book was also a journalist, a columnist who is uh, um, who put incredible amount of work and research into producing this volume. Nepal is an opaque society. If you are in Nepalese here, you may not know it, but it's incredibly difficult to understand, to, to really to get to know what's, what's going on over there. You know, every country will say that. I'm Polish, so they will say, oh yeah, Poles, po 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 Polish situations are unique. Forget about it. It's not unique. It is difficult to understand you. You were locked you know, in your past for 100 years, and it is... Um, it's extraordinary, you know, what is happening there and how all these tectonic movements are taking place. So the book ha helps to, um, in, to, to take away this opacity of the society. And I think for that reason, if not for anything else, there is a lot of other good reasons. This is an incredible contribution, not just really to understand Nepal, but to understand the intricacy of societies like that with movements and uh, populations which are not not only not homogeneous, but difficult to follow. If how the country is wrong, and that, you know, I'm not going to, I'm just, I don't even know the names and acronyms, how difficult it's called. Book helps to understand that, and it's, uh, and it's, and he applies, uh, uses various ways to make it talk to us, and I think that's very important. This is a talent of the writer, and the talent of the researcher who goes not only to um, history, of the history trajectory of the revolutionary movement, but also into poetry and novels and conversations and images and uh, yeah. So so it's Aditya and it's very very good to have you Aditya with us today. And um, as Aditya speaks and um, he will be speaking shortly, we are going to have a, a, a panel. The, 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 the discussion will be joined by the panelists, and it's uh, my very big privilege today to uh, to introduce to you Amrat Samuel, who is a uh, very well known for very many many very many Nepali people, but also to people in New York. He uh, he was a very senior person in the United Nations in charge of the uh, Asia South Pacific Political Department, uh, Political Affairs Department. He also was a special envoy. <coughs> And, and advisor to the Secretary General of Nepal. So he will be with us today. He is with us today, actually. And then we have, of course, uh, our very much own, our own new school, uh, uh, new schools, uh, Asha Guru, professor uh, at the uh, GIA here, and uh, senior director of the India China Institute. Those people will provide us with some uh, light on, uh, and, 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 and perhaps we'll start a discussion that we hope you will be willing and happy to join in. Um, and once this is done, we are not necessarily done, we invite you for a glass of wine and a book signing, which is, uh, which is around the corner in this very building. So there will be a group of people who will lead us there. And that will be the end of our evening. But we did get begin and begin. So here is a Titia. And, um, and let, me just, let me just read you my question. That was not my question. That was the question that we put in the, in the announcement. You don't have to answer this question, but I want to. I want the audience to know the question. How did Maoist in Nepal reinterpret Maoism and, and successfully translated it into political action at a time when liberal democracy uh, dominates uh, public discourse and uh, uh, when communism actually has lost completely its, its legitimacy? So there is a drama. In the question, there's a drama in the book, and uh, how dramatic Aditya will be, I don't know. Aditya, you are Thank you very much. You know, for us Nepalese in the room, I mean, and there are a few, uh, it's difficult to remember. I mean, it's been eight years since the Civil War in Nepal ended, and um, the Maoists have become a completely um, a political force that is, com that is com almost completely entrenched um, in the power structure in Asandu. I think for many many of us it's a bit difficult to remember what a great shock it was, the rise of the Maoists through the early 90s and through the, through the late 90s and through the first part of the 2000s. Um, you know, as, as Atsuya said, 
you know, this was a time when communism had, you know, lost legitimacy. You know, Nepal had had a movement in 1990 which established a constitutional monarchy with a democratic system, a multi-party democratic system. And there are a lot of communists in Nepal for 50 years. There were many communist groups. Most of them had, um, had this, at this time, they said, look, um, we realize communism has failed. We are going to participate in, 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 in multi-party politics like everyone else. And here was this small group which said that um, we refuse to accept that. We still believe that communism is superior to um, in, you know, liberal democracy and we are still going to fight for our cause. And uh, they were an obscure group, you know, and when they started the movement in 1996, most people didn't even know who they were. Um, you know, there's like 50 people with two guns and everyone laughed at them. Everyone said, well, what are these guys going to do? First of all, their ideology is obsolete. Everyone knows that. Even the communists are not with them anymore. Secondly, how, how do they think they're going to fight against the police and the army? Or not at that time, the army wasn't even out, it's the police. Um, third, where are they going to get any support? They kind of stay in the hills and, you know, um, uh, they don't have any internal support, they don't have any external support. I mean, China definitely wasn't supporting them, India wasn't supporting them either, you know. So, so for a group like this, I think there was a great deal of complacency in the mid-90s when, when, when they started their armed movement. And in five years, six years, you know, they had grown into this massive threat to the state. By 2004, 2005, um, they had taken over most of the countryside. Um, and in 2006, uh, I mean, and they didn't manage to, they never managed to take over state power through military means. I mean, you know, uh, they couldn't take over the cities, the, the army was too strong, but through a combination of a negotiated settlement and a popular uprising, they managed to come to power by 2008. Um, so, you know, so, uh, so for me, I mean, this was a question about, you know, the, the question, like, the broad question I start with in my book is, how did this become possible when all the odds were against them, both in terms of pure power, in terms of the international situation, and in terms of ideology? Um, how did they manage to become such a big political force? Um, so this is the question I have in my book. But of course, I mean, with all questions in all books, um, the impulse is more personal. Um, you know, I mean, it, the, the desire for me to write this book came from a personal urge, which was basically, you know, I, I was a generation, you know, I was a teenager when the Maoist war started. Um, like everyone around me, I mean, I was a Kathmandu boy, I mean, I was, you know, um, um, upper middle class, I was, you know, so because, so everyone, I, I barely knew who they were. Um, and if anything, when I, when I went back into, and I, 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 I never thought the Maoist would go anywhere. Um, but they grew, I followed the movement with some interest, some dismay perhaps at some times. And I went back to Kathmandu soon after the peace process began, in, in, after 2006. And I started looking at the movement there, and um, at that time, if there was any attitude that I had towards the Maoists, it was probably one of, you know, interest, I mean, but it was like slight, dis slight disdain, like slight concern, you know. And I was, um, which was something I shared with many other people of my class background, perhaps. But at the same time, I was fascinated as well. I mean, at that time, I started doing journalism in Kathmandu. I mean, it wasn't clear to me who these people were, where they came from. I mean, they, were not, they, were, they weren't in the capital during the years that I was there. Um, and I made an effort to go out and meet Maoist leaders, and started, I started writing about them in the papers. And uh, I traveled the country and met kind of Maoists from all ranks, you know, from the political division, from the military division. And over a period of time, it started to make, it started to become clear to me. You know, in Nepal, there is this, if you go to Kathmandu and talk to people, there are still a lot of people who say, you know, all these Maoists just exploited the resentments of poor people and, and they created this huge upheaval and there was no need for this, you know. But over a period of time, I started realizing how the Maoists said, um, how this was actually, this was, <clears throat> this was a, a large popular movement, and like all large popular movements, it had various diverse strands. The Maoists had managed to create a narrative which managed to um, um, cultivate various constituencies, um, different groups, you know, indigenous groups, Dalits, um, women, um, 
and they had a very um, complex narrative which tried to fit in all these different groups into an overarching kind of theme, which was one of the reasons why the movement succeeded. One reason for the movement's success was because it, it joined together various strands of um, various different movements for, uh, for, for the, uh, that, that had previously existed in isolation, perhaps. Uh, and of course, um, there were contradictions within the Maoist narrative, too, and this was, this was something they were never able to fully reconcile. There were always contradictions between what they advocated for um, Dalits, for example, and um, indigenous groups. There were contradictions between the leadership, which was primarily uh, upper caste, and um, many of their uh, followers. But I realized that this was a phenomenon that hadn't, hadn't been discussed, that, hadn't been, that wasn't adequately recognized as such, even in the Nepal, even in Kathmandu, in the media, um, which was kind of predisposed to kind of, which was prejudiced against the mouse. It continues to be. Um, so this was an impulse for me, and this was one reason why I wanted to write the book. The second reason was, you know, when I, when I was traveling, um, in the few years after the war, a lot of literature started coming out. You know, um, a lot of Maoists started writing their memoirs, a lot of Maoists who during the war kept diaries, they kind of published their diaries in small editions, maybe 100 copies, 200 copies, um, poorly edited, just kind of, you know, just taken out of their, um, they just kind of were back and transferred what they had in notebooks to kind of print and distribute to their friends. And when you travel the country, if you go into kind of Rolpa, for example, which is a Maoist stronghold, which was a Maoist stronghold during the war, or Dan in the Midwestern Hills, you'd meet these Maoists and they would give you copies of their diary, you know, which they had recently published. And they were very keen to have their voices heard. And um, I started reading these, and there's a vast number of these memoirs and diaries and some novels and things like these. And I, and then as, as a person who has a historical interest who is kind of, you know, is very interested in, um, in archives and, you know, especially what people produce and things which aren't read. I mean, I started reading some of these things and, of course, there's a lot of stuff in there which is, you know, boring and you have to say... Is there the propaganda in there? Sorry? Propaganda. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the other interesting thing. I mean, in, in, most people, when you read kind of Maoist documents, for example, or if you read diaries, it comes across as pure propaganda. It comes across as boring almost, you know, for the kind of... But if you read them carefully, I realize that, you know, there is a gen, there is a genuine, there are genuine sentiments and kind of thoughts which shine through. It's not all party line. And even when you read party documents, if you kind of, if you're a novice in reading party documents, it looks like it's just kind of, you know, propaganda, kind of a kind of rather wooden kind of Marxism. But, these documents are produced at particular times, and if you know the history and if you're able to read them, you get substantial insights into the nature of a party strategy at a particular time, and things like this, you know. Um, so, so, I, so in my in my book too, I mean, you know, my it's, my book is partially dependent on the interviews I did, um, and partially on uh, you know scholarly and and newspapers, scholarly material and newspapers, but. A large chunk of my book is kind of based on trying to sift through, analyze, and draw out kind of the experiences of Maoists and uh, and and uh, their strategy tactics from stuff that they wrote themselves, like party documents, as I said earlier, but you know novels, memoirs, um, poetry, diaries, like this kind of thing. Um, so. <clears throat> There are many things that I can say about this, you know, but, I, but maybe I'll also take some questions later. Um, it's, it's for, for some Nepalese here, I'll just say a few things about it, you know, so w besides the fact that they were able to mobilize such a large number of people, you know, which, which they did very successfully, which is a result of, you know, I would say that uh, a very unequal society, a very exclusionary society, where, you know, um, the establishment of liberal democracy, it actually, perhaps in some ways, it increased inequality rather than reduced it. I mean, when you have, you know, this was one thing, I mean, I mean, I went from being kind of a proponent, a believer in kind of pure liberal democracy to something which is not, I'm not a communist by any means, you know, I, mean, I still believe in open society and, and liberal democracy, but someone who kind of 
through the mouse movement, I, I kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, there developed in me a skepticism towards the kind of liberal democracy that existed in Nepal in the 1990s, and that continues today. You know, what, what happened, you know? Um, in 1990, when the democratic movement, when, when a democratic system was established in Nepal, you had a situation where you had to compete for power. And in an extremely exclusionary society, the people who were able to compete for power are those who already have power. Um, so we, we had a situation in Nepal where you know, the representation of um, Dalits, um, who are among the most marginalized groups in Nepal, actually declined after democracy came about, you know. Um, and the, 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 most, the war years actually, they exposed how unequal Nepali society was and the contradictions within Nepali society, you know. It revealed how the state structure was totally unequipped to deal with the Maoists, not because it lacked capacity, but because it um, totally, um, it really didn't know how to deal with um, most Nepali people beyond a small number of people who were already privileged. You know, um, for example, you know, I mean, we could, the way the army operated in places where there were indigenous groups or Dalits or you know Tharus, uh, the way that um, um, groups were systematic. There was a situation in many places where sort of groups would be targeted as being Maoists just because they were from certain backgrounds and descent from the state administration. And the excesses of the army were one reason why so many people joined the Maoists. So it wasn't just that the Maoists, the army Maoists were lucky in, the, in, in, in many ways. The state was so incompetent and so blundering and so, um, and so, um, oppressive for such large section of the population that um, it forced people to join them. And this is important to say now because I think that now in Nepal you have a narrative where um, this has been forgotten. There is, if you ask the army why they failed to contain the Maoists, like, you know, there's a, they say that, well, we never wanted to kind of destroy the Maoists in the first place. I mean, they were the Nepalese and we just wanted to contain their movement and bring them to the negotiating table. Um, and that's what we did, I mean, which is totally untrue because the way the which, in which the army acted was totally brutal. There were massive ex extrajudicial killings. Um, and, uh, but all this rhetoric that comes out in the Nepali discourse, even today, is, um, it masks a very deep failure. And, and I hope that my book, to a certain extent, is able to um, bring some of these issues to light. So maybe if there are some more questions later, I'll talk about them, but I'll, I'll before we go to Tamarat, because I just realized that I didn't say something and I want you to say it, because some people here in the audience do actually know, don't know that uh, Maoists right now are actually part of the government. Could you just uh, just just provide a little of the frame so we know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, the Maoists aren't currently part of the government, but what happened was after NDC uh, joined the peace process in 2006, their elections in 2008, <coughs> and they won the most number of seats in the national parliament, uh, which came as a big shock to the other parties because everyone else was expecting them to perform very poorly to lose. Um, so um, they were in, so for um, about five or six years, they were the largest party. Um, they had a great deal of power. But in the most recent elections, they lost again. So now the parties that were powerful during the 1990s are once again um, in power. I would say that broadly, the Maoists, uh, you know, there were a number of problems with the Maoists in government. They failed to, um, they, you know, first of all, they were never fully in power, first of all. I mean, they were, their agenda, they tried to implement, they had a very ambitious agenda when they came into government for the first time. They tried to make reforms in many different ways. But um, they were relying on coalition partners, which prevented them from fulfilling um, uh, their goals. But on the other hand, there was also a problem in the way they acted. And so they weren't equipped, they weren't kind of prepared for governance, I would say. I and mean, first of all, they came from a very kind of Leninist mindset where, you know, um, they believed that, you know, change could come about only after they had grasped of complete state power. So, you know, through the years and even afterwards, 
your entire agenda was subordinated to, you know, um, the needs of the party to take power. You know, so so what happens is everything is instrumentalized to a certain degree. You know, like all your um, you bring about supporters, you promise them something, and then you tell them that this will be fulfilled at a future date when we kind of when we have total control over over the entire country and. For a, for a long period, I mean, people listen to this and people believe in this, but but um, there was a great disillusionment through the years that the Maoists kind of came to power. The other the other problem was that um, they had a poor grasp of what, what, what can be called, I think, procedural politics, like kind of how to formulate laws, how to implement laws, how to kind of you know use the bureaucracy to kind of uh, to uh, implement certain social goals. So, um, so they are still a major political force. They're not in power right now. But they're part of the one part of them is a part of the coalition, no? Alliance. Uh, no, they're not even uh -huh. part of the coalition anymore. I mean, they're they're in the opposition at the okay. moment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I really um, appreciate the invitation to participate in this event. It's a it's a real privilege. Um, and thank you, um, Ashok, and uh, New School. Thank you, Tsubita, uh, for the um, kind introduction. Um, let me congratulate Aditya, first of all, for this excellent, um, very well researched, and very lucid, very uh, uh, dispassionate and objective account of the Maoist movement in Nepal, uh, which is a, a political, military, organization and movement that have, has had a very profound impact on the political landscape in Nepal. It's a very um, serious and substantive contribution to the body of work that already exists um, on Nepal's recent history. Um, of course, the book raises as many questions as it, as it answers because it's such a vast and complex um, a subject as, as has been described by both speakers that preceded me. But you can only cover so much in, uh, in a single book of this nature that really tries to provide a, an overall portrayal of, um, of this movement. Personally, I would really have um, benefited greatly from this kind of balanced insight and in-depth uh, analysis uh, of the models when I began to mm -hmm. engage them back in 2003, um, and as, as, as I was also doing with the mainstream political parties and, and the Royal Palace um, around 2003. Um, and the aim at that point was really to explore ways in which the UN, uh, along with others, can be helpful to bring about a peaceful end to, to the conflict. Um, so in the course of these early contacts, uh, I really was puzzled by all of the questions that have been raised before. How can a Maoist movement in the 21st century, after the fall of communism and the collapse of communism and the end of history as it was called at that time, um, have such resounding success militarily but also politically in a country like Nepal? Um, what was behind this? Um, and where was this lead? Are we going to see a um, you know an outright victory of uh, of of the communist movement in, uh, in 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 the 21st century in in South Asia, or was this going to lead to some kind of a negotiated solution to uh, uh, to some kind of a compromise? And so I spent time to try to understand uh, whether the Maoists were really prepared for peace, uh, whether these overtures for peace that they were making were tactical or were uh, more, more far-reaching and, uh, and genuine, uh, and also whether they were prepared to <coughs> consider some of the difficult um, compromises that they would have to make in order to come to some kind of a peaceful solution to the conflict and a great future for Nepal with not only the political parties that are now um, partners with the Maoists, but also the royal palace at that time, because this is a period when the king had uh, really usurped power, as Aditya describes in very vivid detail in the book, um, had usurped power and was trying to reinstate absolute monarchy in the country. So it was a very complex, three-sided um, conflict that was going on at the time. 
Um, the models at that time, as you will see in the book, were demanding uh, basically the, uh, the, the election of a constituent assembly whereby the people's representatives would determine the nature of the state and the future constitution of the country. They were also demanding as a transitional arrangement a, uh, a, 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 um, a transitional government and an all-party conference. But the core of their political demand was really the election for a constituent assembly. Now, at a time when they were said to be effectively controlling, if not uh, totally controlling, effectively controlling about 80%, 70 to 80% of the, the, the rural areas of Nepal, what kind of a constituent assembly election could take place that they would not influence and control? Uh, so was, was a call for election of a constituent assembly a political gimmick to uh, basically um, uh, uh, legitimize the control they have over the country? How can, be, how can one hold free and fair election for a constituent assembly when the Maoist army was all over the country and the Nepal army was the Royal Nepal Army was confined to the district capitals. And so I had these conversations with uh, their leaders. It was not easy. This was a period when they had just gone underground after the, the, the breakdown of the ceasefire in 2003 and the negotiations that uh, collapsed. And so it was difficult to have these conversations. So I put some of these questions to them. Would you, for example, agree to have your, your army uh, confined to areas that would be supervised by a third party during the election of the Constituent Assembly? Would you agree to international supervision of the election of the Constituent Assembly? Would you agree to creating a level playing field for all political actors to participate in the Constituent Assembly election? And because these are the kind of questions you would hear in Kathmandu when you raise the question of a Constituent Assembly, Basically, the Kathmandu elite and the political class, but also ordinary people, were largely, I think, dismissive of the, uh, of the demand for a constituent assembly or the, the realistic nature of the demand for a constituent assembly. But the response I got was a bit surprising that they were actually prepared, they would be prepared to confine their forces, to accept international participation in the process, and to allow people to vote freely uh, in this kind of an arrangement. And so I did say to them, well, you need to make this more public. You need to give more meat to the proposals that you are putting. There is no confidence in, uh, in the demand for a constituent assembly as a democratic exercise in the current situation of the country. So eventually, they, they did. I did see some publications, some articles that were written by Babaram Bhattarai, but eventually also by Prachanda, who came out very clearly in saying that they would accept uh, arrangements that would create a level playing field for everyone to participate in a constituent assembly election. Um, further, in 2005, I managed to meet with them face to face uh, at different stages. And uh, the impressions I got from those long discussions was clearly that this was a radical Maoist movement that was evolved it clearly had reached the conclusion that a military victory in Nepal would not be possible. Um, that they have to find a political settlement. But they don't want to abandon the radical agenda of fundamental social political transformation of the country. They are extremely mistrustful, distrustful of the political system that existed then, the uh, parliamentary democracy, the liberal uh, democracy that we were talking about. Um, and clearly, the top leaders came out and said that the communism of the, 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 the classic communism that was practiced in, in other countries and that has failed is not something that we aspire to. That our approach in the 21st century has to be different. There has to be a different approach to advancing the class struggle and, uh, and the, the agenda for social transformation. And so the idea of working with the political parties, working with their, uh, with their adversaries to find some kind of a political solution came across as a genuine interest that they had by the nature of the conflict, but by their own analysis had arrived at. So the conditions were ripe or were becoming ripe um, for, for peace. 
I could see the emergence of a classic uh, situation of, of, of mutually hurting scale. Uh, as Aditya said, there was no possibility for the Maoists to control territory. They, they had not been able to overrun a single uh, uh, capital of any of the 75 districts of Nepal. And so they, 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 the possibility of, of, of military victory clearly was not something that they could aspire to. At the same time, the state uh, had also grudgingly and slowly come to the realization that this is not a force that they can get rid of by military. And so that mutually hurting scale is really the kind of uh, situation that you would like to see in order for uh, compromises to be made. The UN was not uh, trying to mediate in the, in the, in the formal sense. There, there was no, uh, it never sought a formal role of that nature, contrary to many uh, perceptions uh, in, in some quarters. But we spoke to all sides, to all the concerned parties. We carried messages. We tried to concretize some of the uh, ideas on compromise and to bridge the gaps uh, by talking separately to all of the parties. Eventually, many of these ideas, like the ones I mentioned about having an uh, international supervised uh, election, the uh, separation of forces, the supervision of the forces by a third party, find their way, found their way to, into the 12-point the, the understanding that the Maoists and the mainstream political parties reached in November 2005 uh, uh, in, in Delhi. And that was the alliance that emerged uh, as, as, a, as, as an action by both sides against the king. So the two-sided, the three-sided conflict really turned into a two-sided um, struggle uh, pitting the royal palace and the army uh, on the one hand uh, and the Maoists and uh, <coughs> And, and the mainstream political parties in some kind of a very tentative and, and tenuous uh, partnership. Uh, and so that also led to the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in 2006, and that formed the basis of the UN's participation in the implementation of the peace process through UNMIN and also OECHR. I don't want to go into a lot of details here. But a uh, couple of things I want to raise. Uh, if we fast forward, to 2008, and the election, the, the, the success of the Maoists in the election of the uh, Constituent Assembly in April 2008. The result, which uh, basically made the Maoists the largest party in the Constituent Assembly with about 38% of the, of the seats, I think, came as a shock to many, uh, including the mainstream political parties, including uh, international observers, uh, and uh, I, I would say many, uh, many, many also in the palace. Um, before, a few days before the election, we had gone around and spoken to different actors and, 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 uh, and leaders, and we had heard predictions from all sides uh, about, about the result. I would remember very clearly the, the view of one key ambassador in uh, Kathmandu, who said he feared that the Maoists would come out at a distant third after the UML and the uh, Nepal Congress. And the problem would be to keep them in the peace process, mm -hmm. that they wouldn't walk away from the process. As it turned out, they came out first the largest party in the Constituent Assembly election. Only Prashanda in those discussions predicted an outright victory for them, uh, which my thought was very uh, optimistic. Now, so they came out, they emerged as the largest party. They led the government that was formed immediately after that. Um, the Constituent Assembly served as the transitional parliament. The problem was that election and the success of the Maoists really undermined the sense of collaboration and the sense of partnership that the mainstream political parties and the Maoists had forged. Partly because the king was no longer a problem, he had been marginalized, and the monarchy was being abolished. But partly because the expectation amongst the mainstream parties was that the Maoists would lose in the elections. And this was the way to mainstream them and bring them into the process. So contrary to all these expectations and predictions, they came out at the top. So now what do you do with implementing all these uh, ambitious uh, 
uh, transformative agenda issues that have been put into the uh, comprehensive peace agreement. So that trust started to evaporate very quickly. The Maoists took their success in the election as an endorsement by, by the, the, the entire country. And I think that went to their head, uh, to put it very bluntly. And I think their onus was on them as the largest party, as the party that was leading the new government, to reach out and to give reassurance to the other parties. For example, there was a lot of um, discussion about who should become the president. And the broad consensus, I would say at the time, was that uh, Grija Prasad Prasad Parala, uh, the leader of the Nepali Congress, uh, should be president, uh, ceremonial president. But even that, the Maoists would not agree to. And that was the kind of tactical mistake that they made, uh, which also further undermined the confidence and trust between the parties. Um, the many in the other parties also saw the victory uh, of the Maoists as, as, as a threat, and many of them began to feel that their role now was to undermine the Maoists' led government and to make life as difficult as possible for the, for the Maoists. So that political collaboration that existed and led to the overthrow of the monarchy could not continue. And so uh, under these conditions, to agree uh, on a new constitution uh, that addressed the many issues that had been raised by the Maoists, but also by Madesis and by the Janjatis, issues of social exclusion, uh, issues of, of, uh, uh, of, of territorial devolution of power. These kinds of things became the main issues uh, and contentious issues in the constitution making process, and that discussion continues to, to this day. The last point I would like to raise is the whole challenge of the Maoists transitioning from an insurgency into, a mainstream, into the mainstream of politics. This is a challenge that all liberation movements, insurgent groups face around the world because when you're a revolutionary, you only have one agenda, you undermine the, um, the status quo, you overthrow the system, you have, you, have, you have that agenda and the future is something you deal with afterwards. What happened in the past was not an outright victory of one side over the other, it was a negotiated political solution. And so for the Maoists to transform themselves from that very radical and militant group into, uh, into working through the political uh, uh, maze in Kathmandu to try to advance their political and social agenda was a big challenge. Uh, and so uh, it was also a risky initiative because many amongst them, including some top leaders, were very skeptical about negotiating with the mainstream political parties and compromising with them because they feared they would be sucked into the same system that they had set out to, to uh, destroy. So this struggle continues. Um, the election that took place, the second election for the Constituent Assembly after the collapse of the first Constituent Assembly in 2011, the election in 2013 resulted in the Nepali Congress getting the largest numbers, the UML, the second, and the Maoists are now third largest party, a distant third as uh, had been predicted by some in 2008. And so the roles and positions have reversed. Now what does that mean? For the Maoists, this transformation into a mainstream political party, how does that continue? Is it possible for them to work through the, the liberal democratic system to achieve the socio-economic transformation that they seek? Uh, what will it take? What are the costs? What are the compromises that they have to make? Or is this a futile exercise as the breakaway uh, Maoist group, the CPNM, would argue that fundamentally change, fundamental change and multi-party democracy are incompatible? That what the Maoists need to do now is to go back and relaunch the armed revolution. So these are difficult issues that confront the Maoists as a whole. But this is also an issue for the other political parties in the country. Does the victory of last year for the NC and the UML mean that the Maoist and the Madesi and Janjati agenda of inclusion has been defeated? The temptation will be to say yes, and therefore we don't need to dwell 
and spend time on the issues of inclusion, social justice, etc., which are already part of the comprehensive peace agreement. And so it would be very tempting for the mainstream political parties now to say the Maoists have been defeated, their agenda has been defeated, the, the, the issue of inclusion uh, and, and, uh, and uh, addressing the issues of, uh, of the marginalized, historically marginalized groups is not something that we should worry about. In my view, the answers to these questions are already to be found in the, in the many agreements that they have <coughs> signed over the nine years, including the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, by, only by faithfully implementing the Comprehensive Peace Agreement and the associated agreements can lasting peace and stability be consolidated in a new Nepal that all of these parties are aspiring to. So the story continues. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Uh, okay, I think uh, I must say, first of all, thanks to Aditya for really working very hard. I know you have been working on this book for quite some time uh, and uh, producing really, a, I would say, uh, truly comprehensive, in my judgment, I think uh, extremely useful uh, work on contemporary Nepal that I think is not only useful to someone like me. You know, I'm from Nepal, I'm a student of Nepal, I'm not a political scientist. Someone who has followed what's, what, is trans, trans, what has transpired and what is transpiring in Nepal, I think this book it, it, you know, is enormously helpful to really uh, put things in perspective. So thank you um, and uh, congratulations. And before I make my remarks, basically in three categories, you know, some of the things that I find interesting about the book. Uh, and, uh, and I think there are very few books, especially about uh, politics, that you know you can read you know and actually enjoy them uh, and you know you do not want to put them away and but i really felt that and i just you know, enjoy every you know uh, uh, part of this book so i'll talk about that a bit and then i also want to talk a bit about why this book is relevant to those who fall in apart and those you know who are interested in fundamental questions about citizenship why identity matters how do you think about nationalism in the 21st century? What are the takeaways? Before I do that, I just want to uh, tell you that uh, one of the panelists who was listed on the program, our dear friend, uh, Professor Andrew Arado, who is a very well-known you know, uh, scholar of interconstitution, philosopher, someone who really uh, has taken a great deal of interest in studying developments in Nepal, could not be with us because of, of you know, his health situation. He's in a hospital. Uh, yesterday I found out and then I sent a note. And Elspieta had told me that he, yeah, Elspieta had sent me a note saying that, oh, he's in ICU. So I was very concerned about him. But within an hour, I get a note back from him, from his ICU bed saying that, oh, sure, guess what? The nurse who took care of me just last night is a Nepali nurse from Nepal. Not only that, her father was my PhD student <laughs> at the new school. Talk about, you know, so he's in the car carving from coincidence. You know, Nepal features in many different ways. So, so we wish uh, Andrew, uh, you know, quick recovery. And, uh, and I know, you know that he will have a lot to say, and you know, whenever he has time, he will send his thoughts and comments to Aditya. Okay, uh, so I think uh, I've known Aditya for now quite some time. Uh, and, and I can say to you, you know, when I have invited him to speak to my students, whenever I take them to Nepal, or you know, many conversations that I've had, he's truly one of the finest, clearest thinkers uh, in Nepal. I'm sure many of you can guess, he's quite young, only 33, and has already produced a, a book, at least in the Pali circle, it would be a classic. So you can expect many more great works from him. So if this is just the beginning. This is, is, is this your first book launch? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm delighted I'm part of that little history making, right? You know, that we could host you here. So, so really, it's great. I think uh, as, uh, you, know, uh, you know, this book is written in English, uh, it has a particular audience, but it's an important audience, even though very few people in Nepal speak English, but those who speak English and the others who care about Nepal, I think that group is important. Just like the 15% that controls power is that, you know, 5% who can speak in English, read in English. I think for them, if they do take time to read this book, it will help them to put things in perspective. So, so I think uh, it's very important uh, for, you know, uh, the audience that, you know, he's trying to reach out to. Some of the things that I found this book, you know, extremely, uh, you know, unique uh, or useful and interesting is his decision to really work hard to use vernacular materials. You know, he referred to, or he mentioned that, how he read many, many diaries of uh, Maoist soldiers, uh, poems, novels, uh, boring, so-called boring party documents, only someone like Aditya would say they were interesting, and in fact, he found some interesting insights. You know. You know, that tenacity to really sit through a lot of, you know, uh, these materials in Nepali uh, and then able to make some sense out of it and put them uh, in, in, in a way that is, you know, uh, analytically uh, and intellectually uh, stimulating. So, so I really want to thank you for doing that great work. Uh, I think when he did that, he did it uh, by really capturing in some ways the underlying uh, features of Nepali society that made Maoist a political force. So he captures the voices in such a way that when, it, when it's put together, it not only helps us understand why Maoist could become a political force within merely 10 plus years, but also why they are unable to do well. I think that's the part, you know, doesn't quite come out, you know, that, uh, you know, clearly in the book, but those who have watched Nepal struggle with this historic transition, I think you, you, you can begin to get a sense of why, you know, Maoists are struggling with that. What is the reason why they have uh, difficulty uh, both able to grasp the gravity of, you know, the opportunity and the situation that they are confronted with. As he said, the primary focus is uh, 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 on telling the story of Maoist, and uh, if you read the book, it's fascinating uh, to, uh, you know, especially, you know, the focus on Baburam Bhattarai and Prachanda's, you know, uh, struggle, um, both with each other and within the party, is absolutely, uh, you know, it's like, a, you know, uh, some kind of a, you know, crime thriller, you know, that, but really, but it's imbued with ideological, you know, shifting, you know, of ideological positions, tactical moves, all of that is, is fascinating. But I think within that, uh, what is also interesting is, how does Mao's cadres, how do they view the overall struggle? What kind of things that they were able to uh, document, you know, uh, while all of that so-called people's war or insurgency, as the you know government put it, you know, when that was taking place, what happened after you know they came into power? So I think all of that rich history, rich documentation, um, in my opinion, uh, is uh, um, absolutely valuable not only to understand current context, and I'm sure with the passage of time, it, it will become even more valuable. I think uh, contradictions. Uh, is probably uh, uh, would not fully capture, but the book does, you know, give you a sense of you know contradictions at multiple levels, ideological battles, contradictions within you know the party, contradictions within you know other political players, contradictions within the you know, Nepali society, and I think that's a very you know complicated uh, you know story, but he tells it in a beautiful way. So so I think I really uh, want to commend him for that. Since we do not have much time, I just want to talk a bit about what ifs and some takeaways. You know, I think you know people sometimes think that the Maoists are really completely ideologically grounded and they had a particular you know 
uh, you know, ideolo ideological position and they went for it. It's not true when you read the book. You realize that, you know, when he talks about, you know, the uh, uh, one particular moment uh, around 2004-2005 in Berlin, I forgot exactly the date, uh, around right, 2004, right, there was a moment when Babura Bhattrai was stripped of his power and Parchanda was in negotiation through his trusted you know, advisors with the palace. Had the king agreed to make the move and form some kind of alliance with Maos, Nepali history would have been very, very different. There are many, many moments like that where you know, uh, I think uh, one has to question you know, why and under what circumstances you know, uh, the political history could have been you know, written or emerged in a very different way. And, and I think to me that's fascinating. Uh, I think uh, he starts his uh, book with uh, a, you know, a really uh, section on uh, or reference to China under the uh, title The Sun in the Hearts of the People Origins. And uh, it's a fascinating way to uh, situate the uh, entire you know, uh, narrative. Uh, but here I would say, uh, I think uh, partly because of you know, uh, space uh, and you know, his decisions, uh, there's this description about how around 1967, 65-67, that there was you know, this interesting exchange uh, when uh, a bunch of Chinese uh, diplomats based in India were expelled, whether they, were, they would be able to uh, you know, uh, uh, stop in Nepal or not, which they did at some point, and subsequent to that, uh, they were, you know, there were protests in Nepal, uh, in Kathmandu, uh, and then you know he connects and he talks a bit about the Cultural Revolution that was raging in Nepal, uh, in in China, and how that might have in some ways inspired, influenced, or shaped the way Nepali people eventually, as well as the political leaders, especially the left, you know, the leading leaders, how they might have been shaped by this you know, Maoist uh, ideology. Uh, all, you know, that all sounds you know perfectly reasonable, but I think. Uh, I would say when you deal with the China story, uh, I think one has to also situate uh, China story in, in light of the fact that in 1962, China uh, 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 and India had a uh, you know, uh, short war, but uh, India was defeated very badly. And it was, in fact, a very, very serious uh, 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 defeat for uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. So I think. One can understand when you're dealing with China-India factors, especially in you know, India's perception of how Nepal interacts with uh, China, I think that story is a lot more complex. So unfortunately, uh, I think, you know, because of time and space, uh, I think that doesn't quite come through, but I'm sure in his subsequent work, I would encourage, you know, Aditya to uh, look into that more, because, uh, you know, that would really help, you know, us to uh, better connect, you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, what do you call, uh, international dimension of that work. On, on that note, I just want to, even though it's probably not kosher, but uh, one of his closest friends, uh, Prasad Jha, you know, has written uh, a book. It just came out also this year, Battles of the New Republic. Uh, I would urge, uh, you know, that, and in fact, the UN should actually require anyone who works on that problem, mm -hmm. they must read these two books, you know, because, you know, uh, these two books together will give you uh, really a, a, a very comprehensive understanding of the you know, last 20 plus years of Nepali politics. Because together they allow you to understand both the internal dynamics, especially focused on Maoists, but also you know, the geo, uh, you know, uh, regional uh, or geopolitical context. So before we... Right? There's one, uh, one last point. And I think uh, the interesting part for me is, in the book, he alludes to uh, you know the issue of you know how, and I think uh, Tamrat also spoke about it, how the Maoists, in some ways, you know, one might look at where Maoists are, politically speaking, in terms of their political numbers, and one might simply you know uh, you know assume 
that the so-called inclusive agenda or you know the federalist uh, agenda or the Maoist vision is simply inappropriate or you know is not relevant or doesn't have the same salience. I think that to me uh, would be uh, you know uh, you know a wrong because one has to ask the fundamental question as to the very factors which I think Aditya book Aditya's book which doesn't set out to do as the primary focus, but in his book it comes out very clear, the very factors that made Maoist a real political force are really what? That Nepal is highly stratified society, where indigenous people, Dalits, Madesis, women, they do not have equal dignity, they do not have equal political power at all levels from village level, even hamlet level, to regional level, national level. They have been deprived and, and uh, treated unequally as a consequence. There's a huge disparity in terms of the way one sees his or her world around them as a woman, as a Dalit, as an you know, indigenous person. So I think one has to ask, since 2006, the second Janandolan, whether any of those, in, in any of those areas, has there been any progress made? I recently met with one of the young uh, 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 Constituent Assembly member, a guy named Pasan, he's only 28, and it was interesting, he told me that when he got this uh, nomination as part of this 26 people, you know, uh, from the uh, country who were, uh, you know, uh, there are 26, seat, 26 seats reserved for non-political party members to become CA members. One of them, this guy, when he got the nomination, he was supposed to end, uh, supposed to go to uh, Singhadabar, which is the, you know, which is where they take uh, uh, oath. He was told by the his political leader that he has to come and wear the Nepali Dara Surwa. The very symbol of what happened, you know, why the three hit the 200. Uh, years of you know so-called the project of making Nepal as one country with one particular identity, an identity of 15% of the population failed. That he was asked to wear that, you know, outfit called Nepali Dawa Surwa, and he refused. Right. So when you see what's happening in Nepal, in fact, many would argue that the very conditions that made Maoists, you know, uh, what they uh, you know became. I think those continue to persist. In, in, in some ways, they're you know, you know, going in, an, uh, in uh, the in a wrong direction or the negative you know, uh, direction. So then one wonders what's going to transpire. So for that reason, also I think that this book is a very helpful reminder to people that the last 15 years were uh, 15 years were messy, but one has to look at the details of what happened. And that if we were to truly look ahead in terms of you know uh, creating uh, an inclusive democracy, a democracy where notions of uh, you know citizenship, nationalism uh, are attentive to and must pay, and must you know, uh, you know uh, find a way to address you know uh, in, 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 uh, the uh, fundamental questions of being equal citizen with equal dignity and equal opportunity. I think that project in some ways you know, uh, uh, remains. And I think uh, I think this book you know will be a very helpful guide of not to make the same mistake before you know uh, things you know uh, become far more complicated. So I really want to congratulate and I really want to thank Aditya for working so hard on this book. And I'm sure you know we'll see more of this. Thank you. I think we have to open. I have to, we have to open for, uh, for, for your questions. We don't really have much time, but one thing that is in this book, and if you get it, you will see it, is incredible story of, um, of uh, how Maoists and communists were able to mobilize people and offer them space to, to, for modernity, how women were able to escape traditional families, the, 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 the class and the caste structures, and they really began to function on their own. How they gain your subjectivity, it's a different story, it's a different story, it's not a political story, it's a social story, it's a cultural story, very important, the image of the weddings. I love that whole thing. So, those of you who are interested in gender studies, this is also a very interesting insight, offers you insight 
into, into a way of looking for the space in which one can actually act to, well, not only with dignity, but with its own humanity. Uh, yes, questions, yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, uh, my name is Muna Gurum. I am uh, a Nepali, um, and a writer and an educator here in New York City. Aditya, I was just wondering if you could, um, and you don't have to do it right now, maybe a little later, read a part or a passage from your book for us? Hmm. I have the passage. <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you, you just figure out. And you pick anything. <laughs> later. Later. Yes. Um, as soon as you said that the king, that the king's government was incompetent, I immediately knew that, uh, that uh, an insurgency had to succeed because people are not complicated. They want basic things. They want the garbage picked up. They want uh, their social conflicts adjudicated fairly. They, you know, they, they want a shot at them and they're making a living and educating their kids. And, you know, it's, it's not complicated. Um, um, uh, how did the Maoists provide that? Because it, it, the, the Maoists weren't just providing ideology. Nobody cares about ideology, especially, you know, uh, the people. Um, uh, how, what did the Maoists do that drew people behind them so ardently? Um, well, I mean, as you said, you know, it's the grounds for an insurgency, I mean, it existed. Um, the Maoists filled the gap, I mean, successfully filled the gap because they're a highly organized force, you know, which could cater to different constituencies, trying to bring, toge bring them together, bridge over a contradiction that might exist between each of them, things like that. But more specifically, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's during the war, the Maoists had a very specific social agenda. You know, I mean, there are very, very diverse strands to how the Maoists dealt with various groups, I mean, you know. It's, um, during the war, there was a conscious effort to, for example, um, do away with caste-based discrimination in the villages. Um, there was a Maoist parallel government, which, um, you know, uh, had strong punishments for those who kind of practice untouchability, for example. You know, um, there were kind of rituals organized to. Um, deliberate rituals to kind of, you know, so-called, to kind of um, pollute, so-called pollute, kind of places like temples or Brahmin's houses, you know, things like that, which kind of gave them a lot of kind of in Dalits a kind of sense of, you know, empowerment. You know, that is one example. You know, another example is, uh, they, they also did a pretty good job, um, let's see, taking care of people who, like, if you, if I was, if, if I was targeted as a member of my uh, of the community that I belonged in, and I was not part of the political force, but my parents were killed, uh, the Maoists would kind of come in and kind of take care of me or my children. They were kind of you know organized schools that they had, so they gave a kind of sense of belongingness within the party in that sense. Um, these are just some examples. I mean, there are many others. Right. I, I, I will, we will just remind that you know people have to move out. Some people that because the class starts here at. And quarter past. So, what I'm going to do is to do the following. We are not going anywhere. We are going to have a glass of wine. Each of you can talk to the Aditya. We are going to follow a, a group of people around the corner and reassemble there in a beautiful gallery and, and, and talk a little bit more and let the class happen here. We're terribly sorry, but this is the only time we could have got. got. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, you. But uh, the, the discussion is not going to be Thank you.